So we're going to talk a little bit tonight about what happens. So we get a stress response, a couple different things that happen. Number one, we get cortisol elevation. So we get this increase in stress and cortisol causes over time when the stress becomes chronic causes loss of muscle. And so what's happening to many of you that are locked down is you've been overly stressed out, higher cortisol levels, you've lost some of your muscle mass, which has reduced your metabolic rate. And when your metabolic rate is reduced, you actually gain weight, gain fat, specifically visceral fat, fat around your heart, fat around your intestine. The type of fat that we know is associated with heart attacks and massive disease. And so this has been ongoing for a number of you, uh, including to, to a degree myself. Um, and that, you know, that, that response, that cortisol increase in cortisol response has this kind of snowball or domino like effect. Now you should also be aware that too much excessive cortisol over time depletes things like vitamin D and magnesium and calcium. So over time, it, you know, magnesium, calcium being electrolytes that are important for neurological function and for the stress response. And so a lot of people will start to develop, aside from developing that muscle loss under the loss of electrolytes that are important for muscle function, we also get muscle spasms. Muscles start to shorten they start to spasm, they start to twitch, they start to become prone to injury. So as many of you are under the stress, okay, this is, this is specifically just cortisol on one aspect. We also have another side effect of increased cortisol, which is an elevation in blood sugar. And I've seen this in a lot of my, uh, a lot of my clients as they're coming through the doors the, the past month or so. We're seeing a lot of people with elevations in their blood sugar as a result of that increased stress load. So that blood sugar heightens, increases blood viscosity. So we get a thicker blood and that's because it glycates the proteins in the blood, making the blood viscosity increase, which puts more pressure on your heart and puts more pressure on your, on your vascular tree, on your peripheral vascular tree. It makes it harder for blood and oxygen to get into those tissues. So we get that increase in blood sugar, increase in viscosity, and that increase in sugar increases the risk for chronic, I'm just going to abbreviate here, chronic degenerative disease. So, you know, it's not the one time, it's not like the acute stress where somebody jumped out from behind a door and scared you and your cortisol, you know, jumped up very quickly and then recovered. This is the chronic stress. This is the stress that many of you are facing because number one, you thought a disease was coming to kill you. Um, number two, you may have lost your ability to earn your livelihood and then that stress buckles. Number three, you know, with that loss of livelihood comes a where am I, how am I going to feed my family? How am I going to pay my rent, etc. And that chronic stress, again, setting in in a very, very big way, increasing the risk. This is what we're actually in for. If this madness continues to persist, many of, many of you um, are going to continue to buckle under this continued load of stress, which is why I encourage you to turn off the TV and, and focus on what you can actually be doing in your life to improve your life and don't focus on the, the stories and the, and the, uh, the narrative that, that many of the media outlets are trying to get you to dive into. So again, that's this, so this is one aspect, okay? So cortisol increase, blood sugar increase, but one of the other things that chronic stress is gonna drive up is it's gonna drive up adrenaline. And it's gonna drive up uh, noradrenaline as well. Now, these are neurotransmitters, chemicals produced by your adrenal glands that over time are going to ramp up your sympathetic nervous system. So you get this impact. Should I spell that right for you? You get this impact on the fight or flight system. So you've ramped up your fight or flight system you know, if we look at long term, kind of what that does is one, it reduces your ability to digest. So it shuts off your digestive tract. It reduces your ability to sleep well. Okay, so those are two aspects of what, you know, physiological impacts of what happens when sympathetic nervous system is turned on 
too high and too hard. Again, you don't digest as well, you don't sleep as well. What happens when you don't digest as well is you don't get vitamins and minerals, the nutrients from the food. You don't process those and get those and access those as well. But secondarily to that, when you're not sleeping, you're not healing and repairing. And so when you're not healing and you're not repairing, you're not properly sleeping, it's going to create a feedback loop and it's going to increase your stress. And so we get this in perpetuity of this problem just continuing to feed itself. It becomes self-feeding like a snowball that starts out small at the top of the mountain. And as it rolls, it picks up steam, it picks up mass until it creates an avalanche. And here's what we don't want to see happen to you. I don't want to see any of you having this process go on any longer than what's necessary where it wrecks you, where it crashes your health, because it's when you get to that point where your health is now crashed um, that you can't take care of your family. So the best, again, the best way that you can take care of your family is by taking care of yourself, by not allowing, not allowing this to get the upper hand and get the best of you. So make sure that you're supporting your stress mechanism. And part of how you know, we can control this adrenaline. It, there's a couple different things. In my opinion, one of the best ways to do it is prayer. For those of you that may not be as religious, you know, things like meditation, deep breathing exercises can also be helpful to control um, the level of adrenaline, noradren noradrenaline secretion that are driving that sympathetic response. The other thing that you can do, you know, with, with curfews and lockdown that are still in place depending on where you live, you know, You've got a family, hopefully you've got a family, spend time with them. Because when this thing, when this thing lifts, or when we force it to lift as, as citizens, um, you might find that this is gonna be harder to come by when you're fighting to, to try to find your way to earn a living again. So again, you know, these two things can kind of reduce that sympathetic nervous tone and help you to maintain your digestion and maintain your sleep. Now, what I'm not saying here, so what I'm trying to teach you is, is that I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't have stress, and I'm not saying that stress is necessarily even a bad thing right now. I think stress is built in on purpose. I think we, we have the ability to create these hormones and these chemicals on purpose, and I think sometimes they're necessary, and we're living through a time where I think in part a lot of this is, is absolutely necessary because stress also drives as much as it can drive, the stress response can drive the wrong style of behavior because you're thinking, potentially thinking in your limbic brain, you can be under stress but still keep a calm, cool, collected head around you so that you can make intelligent decisions. And so sometimes stress kicks us into gear, again, as long as you're not heightened in, in the sense where you're making bad decisions from your limbic brain, sometimes stress can, can put us into, in, into a mode where we're put in a place where we need to make decisions and we make them much quicker as opposed to, um, as opposed to procrastinating around them uh, when we're not under, under certain types of stress. So stress is not always bad, it's, but it's that chronic stress. If you let it overwhelm you, if you let it get to you to this level, it's going to create a major problem. So what can you do nutritionally right now? Aside from, you know, we, we've got prayer, we've got meditation, we've got family time, which are action steps that you can take in your current life to kind of try to help mitigate to a certain degree some of this. But then we've also got, you know, again, some of the other side effects of that increase in blood sugar, that reduction or that loss of muscle. So one of the things, you know, I've talked about this a number of times, but one of the things that you can be doing right now and that you should be doing is also making sure you're not stopping your exercise. What happens to a lot of people is when the stress comes, they quit exercising or they quit being physically active. It's a huge mistake. And, uh, and, and it's because when you are already in a state of catabolic breakdown as a result of cortisol, you don't want to send another message to your body saying, hey, we don't need the muscle. Uh, you want to send the message to your body that, you, yes, you're under stress, but yes, you still need this muscle. And this way you don't, you don't suffer through the muscle atrophy, the water retention, the weight gain, the visceral fat increase. So exercise becomes very important. Now, one of the things under stress too that you do have to keep in mind is you may not want to do as severe of exercise as what you, you might do when you're not under stress. In essence, you know, don't work yourself into the ground with your exercise, but make sure you maintain a consistent flow of it. My, my, my best advice I can give you, simplest thing that you can do in this type of time is a style of workout called a Tabata workout. These are really quick workouts. They're about four minutes long. 
and use body weight activities for these act for these exercises. So it's about as a four minute exercise routine. I've talked about this too in the past, where you you know pick a body weight movement like a push up, set your alarm clock for four minutes, do twenty seconds of push ups followed by ten seconds of rest. Do that eight times, and that accumulates over a four minute period of time, right? So do eight rounds of that, and that's four minutes, and that's half of your workout routine for the day. So you can pick two Tabatas, and it's a Tabata times two, where again, you're not overworking your muscles, you're not working yourself into the ground, and you're still capable of functioning, and you're not, you know, again, you're not depleting your energy and your resources to such a great degree, combined with chronic stress that you can't continue to function. So that Tabata, prayer, meditation, family time, again, all things that you want to make sure that you're focusing on. And then the other thing that, that happens during this time, diet-wise, nutritionally-wise, is that increase in stress increases your blood sugar. And one of the other side effects is it increases sugar craving. So what happens to a lot of people is they gravitate toward those foods that give them the most comfort. Those foods that give them the, the um, kind of the, I call them the, the, the nursery foods, is the foods that maybe when you grew up with that your mom or dad gave you that gave you comfort, right? Your comfort foods, whether that's, you know, some type of ice cream or whether that's some type of cakes, cookies, pastries, whatever that might be, whatever it is for you. For some people, it's chocolate, whatever that is. But again, that increases in sugar craving. Um, and the problem with that is, is the more sugar you eat, the more you feed the, the beast. So that sugar craving, if you follow through with it, you know, we all have yeast in our, in our GI tracts, but what happens to a lot of people is the higher the sugar count, higher the sugar goes, the more predilection toward growing excessive quantities of yeast in the GI tract, and that can go systemic, creating chronic inflammation, among other things. Uh, so, so again, you got to watch out for this too, because this can sneak up. And this, for some people, is, is not sugar, but it we could just draw another element in here. It's also alcohol. And so you increase your alcohol. Remember that alcohol calorically is, 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 um, is, is second only to fat in terms of its total caloric intake. It's higher. Um, seven calories per gram is what you get when you're using alcohol. But there's also a lot of, for most, there's a lot of sugar in alcohol. So again, increase sugar through consumption of alcohol, and it's like a double hit because alcohol is an immunosuppressant and can cause inflammation and can cause liver damage, among other things. So if you become a chronic alcohol drinker during this time, what again, what you're doing is you're feeding that mechanism through biochemical stress, and you don't want to get it caught into that ordeal either. So again, a lot of elements off of this central theme of increased stress that you want to be watching out for right now. Now, some of my favorite things to get through stress, nutrient support through stress. Um, one of my favorite is the same thing I talked about for immune system support, and that is vitamin C. Vitamin C is critical during times of stress. Humans need more vitamin C when they're under chronic stress. And uh, Research studies um, show and again, this isn't human research, but in, in, in animal studies, in goats as an example, goats will make 15 to 20 grams of vitamin C a day when they're put under stress. And the reason why we, we use goats is because humans can't make their own vitamin C. So we goats can make their own vitamin C. So we're trying to get an idea for the, the, uh, the what's called conditional need of an animal when high stress levels hit. So increasing vitamin C uh, during times of intense stress where we don't see a kind of a, a light at the end of the tunnel. We don't know when that stress is going to end can sometimes be a very, very effective way. Remember, one of the things vitamin C helps to do is it helps to make sure that you don't run out of adrenaline, noradrenaline, and also dopamine. Dopamine is another neurotransmitter and, and vitamin C is necessary. You need vitamin C in order to be able to properly produce dopamine, which is our happy hormone. Without it, we can become depressed. We can become fatigued and lethargic. We can develop things like muscle tremors. So there are a lot of side effects that come into low vitamin C inducing dopamine deficit. So vitamin C is one of those things that you can do during times of intense stress. One of my other favorites is pantothenic acid, PA, uh, I'll abbreviate it, but vit that's vitamin B5. Vitamin B5 is nicknamed. It's, it's actually discovered by a famous biochemist by the name of Roger Williams. And this B vitamin, is called the anti-stress factor or the anti-graying factor. 
Um, and so vitamin B5 plays a, a major, major role in your adrenal glands being able to keep up when under stress. So I'd say if, if you could only pick two nutrients for acute or for intense chronic stress, vitamin C and pantothenic acid are the two that I would recommend. You know, you know beyond that, certainly you want to make sure you're eating well, you're eating organically. Um, you know, again, don't fall into that whole line of where we come over here and we start craving, our blood sugar's already going up, but now we start craving, we start making poor dietary decisions. That'll just get you into more trouble. So again, the vitamin C, the vitamin B5, very, very important in terms of times of chronic stress without end. Now there's some other things that you can do nutritionally and they're kind of less to do with vitamins and minerals, but understand that, that um, and, and what some people do, and if you eat organ meat, this is great. You can, if you actually have access to adrenal gland, but there's a, there's a type of supplement called an adrenal glandular. And these uh, are basically, it's basically adrenal organ gland in capsule form that you can swallow. And it contains a number of different nutrients, a number of different, um, a number of different um chemical compounds that can help support you through times of great stress. So this is another th addition that you can add on. The other thing you need to know is the higher and the longer you have stress, the more you're going to lose as a, just a general rule of thumb. So increased stress leads to an increase of vitamin and mineral excretion. Uh, and this has been studied in a number in humans. It's been studied a number of times is we know that during times of intense stress, we actually have nutritional def deficiencies that can start to occur because the body's burning through more of those nutrients. But in many ways, we also um, excrete more of those nutrients in the urine uh, during times of, of, of long-term stress. So you can become quite malnourished. So the other thing I highly recommend that you're taking during times of stress like this is a quality multivitamin. So something that has, you know, the vitamins and the main minerals in it to support you and to support your body's ability to continue to be able to function during those times. So again, back to my core message, which is nutritional biochemistry. I wanted to get back to that tonight. We've been so focused on COVID and now we're having, you know, now we're having riots in the street. A lot of you are really worried. I wanted to give you something tangible that you could take away today it would really give you um, the ability to preserve your health as we go through this very, very unpredictable year so far of 2020. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.